just as a quick intro, I think the best way to think about this presentation is that it may be a little bit chaotic, but um, I'm, I mainly want to showcase a few ideas that I think are extremely important for the future of the space, and then want to exemplify how you can best leverage these ideas with a few hackathon projects that I've done and just a few general proof of concepts that I've designed with some friends in Oxford. Um, so yeah, my is, uh, the title of my talk is Web3 Credentials for Web2 Scientists, um, the path to an integrated science which supports innovation and diversity. Um, I'm going to quickly take, take a step back and think about why credentials actually matter and particularly why they might matter for DSI. Um, so I did an undergrad in physics and philosophy um, and I, I just want to showcase what, you know, what, what science is about and maybe uh, kick off the discussion in, in this way. So I think in, in general in science we develop theories and models to better understand the world. And I think the purpose of, of these theories and models is um, to move at least to a more accurate or truer representation of the world in general. And I think two, two important qualities of such scientific theories are its theoretical soundness and empirical support for such theories. And I mean, various theories fit into the spectrum in various ways. For example, you can think of say string theory in physics, which has very limited uh, empirical support, was extremely sort of theoretically clear and very sound and people have thought very carefully about the mathematical structure of this theory. Uh, and therefore it's sort of like scores very well on one part of the scale, but then doesn't score very well on the other. And on the other hand, you can think of, for example, uh, a clinic, uh, some sort of clinical trial for a drug where the mechanism by which the drug work is not very well understood, but we know empirically that it helps a lot of people get better for certain diseases. And, and this th theory then would have a lot of empirical support, but maybe wouldn't be so theoretically sound. And I think credentials are important in so far as, as they are really instrumental for guiding scientific discourse and advancement. Um, if you want to sort of assess whether a, a theory is particularly sound or has a lot of empirical support, I think you'll find credential serve as sort of a tool as to inform the likelihood of the correctness of a particular person's assessment. Um, that is obviously not to say that credentials are the be all and end all, but if you want to, for example, assess the correctness of a mathematical proof, um, someone has, I don't know, a background in studying literature, it's just extremely unlikely that they'll find an error in the proof. Um, and of course, yeah, this is not to say that sort of credentials are the thing that um, inform scientific dis discussion beyond anything else. And I think science is really about forming correct ideas that are both theoretically sound and have empirical support. But I think credentials are just an extremely important tool um, in, in moving science in the direction that we want to move it. Um, yeah, now we might wonder why we want um, Web3 credentials. I think um, I share my enthusiasm for DSI with a lot of people in the room here and a lot of people at this conference. I think it's shown a lot of promise and there's a lot of pilot projects which are, which are extremely excited. Um, and I think um, we should definitely believe in, in the virtues and values of open science where people share data sets um, and people um, generally like are very open in, in sharing advancements with the community and engage as many people as possible in, in scientific discourse. And I think a key sort of DSI feature that we need is that if we have any sort of on-chain research activity, that must be reasonably traced to some sort of unique researcher identity. And there can be use cases where maybe it is reasonable to sort of like hide someone's, someone's real identity, for example, when we're doing peer review. But I think it's still important that there's a way for them to prove that they have some sort of unique researcher identity and that must be linked to some sort of credential system. And at the same time, I think um, if we want to ensure that we safeguard our DSI protocols, it's really important that we have some sort of rigorous civil resistance mechanism, because otherwise we can imagine a lot of these adversarial scenarios where, for example, one person creates 100 Ethereum addresses, and if we don't require them to be sort of associated with some credential system, then they could just spam, say it's about getting funding for some sort of um, research proposal, they can just spam a particular protocol with all these requests, or they can you know, start making fake identities and just upvoting their research proposal to get funding. And I think that really undermines, you know, what, what DSI is about. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot of sort of credentialization which already exists in the world. And I think I just want to reiterate that a lot of the stuff that exists out there in the Web2 world is actually quite good. Um, so, for example, we have a, a lot of journals and preprint servers, um, for example, like the archive or bio archive. And then obviously there's a lot of um, classic journals where a lot of kind of research is credentialized because it's been peer reviewed and people have looked at it. 
And of course, we also have institutions which sort of verify your status as a researcher or I don't know, your status as a, as a professor or as a postdoc. And then there's also you know, some other online organizations like GitHub where people share code repositories or even, uh, for example, Stack Overflow where people build up reputation for correctly answering questions for specific scientific problems. And um, then I think at last I want to highlight ORCID, which I think currently is simply um, the best aggregator of information um, in Web2. So ORCID collaborates with a lot of institutions so that you can verify your status as a researcher or as a PhD student or a professor, and also aggregates a lot of information from journals, preprint servers. I think you can even, for example, link code bases through GitHub. And I think currently it's, it's the best aggregator of information and the best sort of verifier of your research credentials that, that is out there. And I think, yeah, actually the, the next question is, um, what should a blockchain-based identity and credential layer look like? And how can we exist it with, uh, how can we seamlessly integrate it with existing tools? Because I think the idea is not to reinvent the wheel, um, but the, the idea is kind of thinking about interoperability and ease of use so that we can onboard as many people from, you know, existing scientific communities into, into DSA as possible. And here I just want to highlight um, sort of demo project, which is actually really simple. So um, we can go on the Orchid Auth page. Um, I'll just quickly bring it up, um, where we see how people can register themselves on a smart contract that we wrote, where um, there's a secure way of uniquely associating your ETH address with your ORCID ID. So you can see here, this is a transaction on Polygon Mumbai. And if I, for example, yeah, this is for example me, um, I click on this entry in the registry, and this is my Ethereum address. So um, any actions I take on chain will be uniquely identified with this ORCID ID, because I have logged in with ORCID and then signed a particular message with my address of, over which I have control. And then I can check, oh yeah, that's really me. Oh yeah, I'm a researcher at Oxford and yeah, I've published some papers. Um, and I think this is um, just serves as kind of a um, proof of concept of what can be done. And this was also, for example, then used in some, uh, for some particular use cases. And if you're interested, you can check it out, orchidauth.vsl, and you can register and just see what this looks like. Um, so the question then is maybe, what can these research credential tools actually be used for? Um, so firstly, I think um, they can be extremely valuable in designing these composable researcher profiles. Um, so you just log in with your wallet, and then uh, once you've hooked up Orchid, you can uh, kind of connect all these other feeds which pour data into your profile and aggregate it in a way that anyone who, for example, wishes to interact with you or wants to see what sort of stuff you're working on can just look at your profile. And this could also then be stored in a clever way on IPFS and can see exactly what you're doing because you've uniquely linked your ETH address to your ORCID. And obviously, you can then also integrate, for example, GitHub or Twitter or anything else. Um, and then people can really see what you're actually working on and, and, and what you're doing. And I will say that OPSI, who I've chatted to a bit over the past few months are doing something very similar. And I think we share a very similar vision to them. And yeah, maybe there'll be, there'll be some scope for climbing in the future. I think they've, they've uh, gone a bit further and haven't just kind of hacked this together, but actually have a full-time team working on this with some designers, whereas this was just, uh, yeah, the outgrowth of a hackathon project. Um, I think the next thing I, I want to quickly highlight, I think you've maybe already seen this, is that um, currently a lack of, there's, there are simply a lack of incentive for traditional peer reviews. Peer reviewers are generally not paid for their reviews. And also um, for successfully reviewing a paper and say, putting, pouring a lot of time and effort into a really good review, you're not really rewarded with any sort of credentials. I mean, some journals openly publish reviews after they publish a paper, but often uh, there's a pretty kind of OPEC reward where yeah, you successfully reviewed a paper, but it's unlikely that anyone will ever see this review or will kind of give you kudos for successfully reviewing this. And I'm not gonna, Go into this. Um, you can you can check it out here. I think Stefan already very well presented this uh, very nicely yesterday. Um, but here you can see that this is kind of a Web three peer review protocol, which integrates with your Orchid login, and also importantly, kind of preserves the privacy of the reviewer, whilst the reviewer can still prove that they reviewed a particular paper if it's published in the aftermath. 
And I think this is like a really desirable feature of a particular Web3 peer, uh, peer review protocol. And then there's also the monetary incentives that you are rewarded if you successfully review a paper and the review is accepted. And yeah, I highly recommend checking this out. Maybe this will be something that we'll iterate further on in the future. And this was just the, the paper there. It's just, I think, uh, an extremely comprehensive survey from 2015, where I think about 80% of researchers who partook in the survey acknowledged that the peer review process is not sufficiently incentivized and is currently kind of broken and, and lacks a lot of things. The next idea I want to quickly talk about, there's no, unfortunately, no proof of concept here. Uh, even though I know someone built one in Oxford and I'm, I'm, I'm in touch with them and maybe uh, we'll, we'll see what this leads to, is that, I mean, a lot of people these days use Twitter kind of for research purposes where they look at people, uh, they look at other people's profiles and then they sh simply share papers and there's extremely lively discussions in threads. And I think this is actually a really valuable tool of modern research and is actually where a lot of discourse happens. Now, I think some people have got a bit, bit disillusioned with Twitter recently and the question is, um, whether it's really open and whether um, other people own your data. Um, so we can think of creating like a kind of decentralized social network, for example, like, um, for example, on Lens, which is something currently built by Aave, where it's really you that owns like all the data associated with each, um, say, like Web3 tweet you make. And again, here, if you associate your address with some sort of research credentials, for example, as sort of um, parameterized by your orchid, you could just easily log in with your wallet. And then this could create some sort of composable research feed uh, from decentralized data sources if, if more people kind of integrate their existing research and store it on chain. And then there could be a whole uh, reputational system. And for example, some on chain citation graphs uh, where people are um, up and down voicing research and are engaging with existing research in a way that all this information is captured in a way that it can be accessed by anyone. Um, and this brings me on to like the last use case I want to show, showcase. And before that, I will just highlight like a recent paper from Nature where this is an extremely comprehensive sociological analysis of kind of science. It's, I would say maybe you'd call this meta science, where people have analyzed um, papers and patents from the last 50 years. And using a variety of metrics, the authors showed that in general, patents and patents are becoming less and less disruptive over time and are more likely to just reinforce the scientific status quo, as you can see here. So the CD is some sort of disruption index, which they calculated using a variety of metrics. And you can see that in almost all areas since the 1950s and 1980s, the disruptiveness of science has significantly decreased. And you may ask why that is. And I guess we are reaching kind of the frontiers where perhaps there are fewer low hanging fruits. But also I think it's because of the way scientific research is perhaps currently incentivized. And maybe that's something uh, which we can rethink as well. So if you think about the incentive system at the moment, I think people are much more incentivized to apply for grants for projects which kind of incrementally improve existing science because that is a much safer bet. You're much more likely to get funded for that. Whereas if you wanna pursue something extremely revolutionary, you're just much less likely to get funding for it from say any sort of governmental research body. And uh, there are a lot of interesting ideas in this sort of direction. And um, if you're, for example, interested in hypersets, I recommend going to um, the talk at I think 3.45 today by Hawkeye, and I don't wanna take away any of his steam. But the basic idea is that you can kind of, as soon as you embark on some sort of radical or uh, really risky research endeavor, you can mint yourself a hypersert which is an NFT where you kind of prove that you are the one who's pursuing this research direction. And then if this research becomes really disruptive and really impactful, you can be retroactively rewarded for having pursued this research in the first place um, by people buying, buying this hyper cert. And the way this can work in kind of a Web3 on-chain um, native version is for example, um, in this particular way. So this was a hackathon project that I worked on in F Amsterdam, where we did retroactive public goods funding on chain. I don't think anyone has ever done that before or anyone has done that since then, in, which is building a full um, smart contract suite where you have people kind of submitting these hyperserts. We just called them, they submitted nominations for projects they were working on. And then there was uh, a period uh, where we had some sort of badge holders, which were like the evaluators for the impact of these projects and they could vote on which project they thought was the most impactful, the most disruptive. And then these people would get the, the um, people who received the most votes 
we get rewarded and the voting ha happened quadratically. So it kind of increased diversity. And then you can see on the right hand side as well, there, there were all these nice data analytics tools where you could see sort of where people cast their vote. And this all interfaced both with, with um, the blockchain. So Ethereum kind of um, secured this whole thing where in the contracts, all the disbursement was uh, deterministically tied to the voting outcomes. And all the data was also made available in IPFS. So people's nomination data, um, the votes people cast were both available in the contract and on IPFS. And the thing I want to reiterate again, maybe to get back to the <laughs> initial topic of my talk is that any sort of protocol which retroactively rewards researchers um, has to rely on some sort of way for experts to evaluate the research in the first place. And if you want an expert committee or a committee of evaluators to, to kind of cast their vote on what, which, which research endeavors they found to be the best, the most disruptive or the most promising, they need to somehow be sourced, identified and authenticated. Because you can't have a situation where people are like creating 50 addresses and they're just like upvoting their own research because at the end of the day, science isn't, doesn't really work like, like a democracy in the sense that you should just like give everyone a vote on, on I don't know, which research has been the most impactful. Maybe that's, that's the way some people think you, you, you should be doing it, but I, I think that's unlikely that that's the direction we're going to pursue in the future. And yeah, if you want to make um, retroactive public goods funding sort of work in, in a way that I think is best, I think you need some sort of rigorous uh, credentialization layer underneath. And yeah, that's, that's also the end of my talk. Uh, I just want to say thanks to all my collaborators. So you see uh, Stefan, who worked with me on the peer review protocol, who's also sat over there. Um, then thanks to all my uh, collaborators from Oxford. This is a picture from Amsterdam where we, uh, I think we had been awake for about 36 hours at this point when the picture was taken. Um, who also then worked with me on the ORCID auth stuff um, and the proof of concepts that, that I've showcased here. Um, and yeah, we were also supported by Protocol Labs and the Ethereum Foundation with some small grants after the hackathon to pursue some of these research directions. And if you want to get in touch, please don't hesitate. There are my contact details. And thanks so much for listening. I'm happy to take any questions. We have time for like one question. So. Anyway. I have a question. Yeah. Oh, wait, no, you can go. go. <laughs> I think one question that I have is like, uh, there's, we often talk about the rewarding the peer reviewers, but I feel like it's important not to just reward them for their work in a, in a meaningless way just because they do the work, because it's not only the peer reviewer doing, doing really the work, the important thing really is the validation, right? Like yeah. we, we came up with that idea to pay them because it's like the validator of the blockchain. Yeah. It's like the, validating the scientific record. And I think we need to dive deeper into how that actually, how the validation actually looks like, because it's not really the peer reviewer doing all the work. Yeah. That's really also an editor, editorial board that does a lot of the work yeah. to decide what is actually happening there. And then they, they assign the peer reviewers, and that's the real work in a way. There's, there's, a, like, there's a lot to be done, and the publishers actually pay people to do their job. And they manage multiple journals, they are not always scientific. Like the, the editorial boards get money, right? But those who manage the journals, they get even, like they work for Elsevier directly, for example, for example. And I think we have to, as a community also, consider this, if we actually want to be competitive, instead of just paying reviewers, we have to make a system that, in which you can actually get paid for your expertise. Yeah. Uh, if you, and I think that would be an interesting addition. And I would like to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah, I mean, one interesting thing of the protocol that there is, there, obviously there is a way to pay both say the approvers or the editors, as well as the reviewers. You can kind of customize that in the contract where you say, I don't know, this proportion of the reward pool goes to the approver or the, uh, the editor and this proportion of the reward pool goes to the peer reviewer. And I think one other appealing thing of this kind of proof of concept that we showed is that it's like a really rigorous, rigorous way for people to have a, an immutable ledger of successful reviews that they've conducted and also for editors to say, that they have approved like X many successful peer reviews. Um, so I think that's maybe another, another appealing feature that not all the rewards have to be monetary, but you can kind of showcase to um, other people that you're doing a lot of work which kind of serves the community and the advancement of science. Because, I mean, it depends on the journal, but right now you could be doing hundreds and hundreds of peer reviews every year and you are really meaningfully contributing to the advancement of science but you're not really rewarded with any sort of credentials that other people can look at. I mean, some journals do that, but, but most really don't. And I think that's also where the power of these types of protocols may lie. Um, thank you, Dan. Cool.
Uh, if you guys have any more questions, um, you're going to be around? Yeah, I'll be around. Amazing. Okay.